first of all, welcome everybody to our webinar titled Research into Treatments for PKD. My name is Jess. I am part of the PKD Australia team and I will be hosting this this evening. And I would just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we meet today. And I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Now, leading the presentation this evening is Professor Ian Smythe, who is actually joining us all the way from Edinburgh in Scotland, and also Dr. Danny Cottle in Melbourne, Australia. Now, a little bit about our, um, our host this evening. Professor Ian is a fellow at Monash University in Melbourne, even though he's currently in Edinburgh. And Dr. Danny is a research fellow also at Monash University in um, Ian's laboratory. Now, in 2023, uh, Professor Ian and Dr. Um, Denny co-founded a new Monash biotech company called Existence Bio, which was established with the support from the Curator Funding Scheme to advance research to develop new therapeutics for PKD. And this is what we'll be hearing more about this evening. Um, now, during the presentation, if you have any questions that you think of, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will endeavour to answer them. And um, uh, Ian and Danny have also been sent the list of questions that have already come through from those who sent them through when they registered. So without further ado, Professor Ian, I will hand over to you and I believe you have some slides to share. So we will get started with that. I do indeed. Welcome. Can everyone hear me? Yes. See the great big green and blue kidney. Fantastic. Uh, look, thanks so much for everyone for coming. Uh, it's a real privilege for Denny and I to be here uh, and talk about some of the things that we've been doing in the lab, some of the things we've been trying to do in the uh, in the sort of drug development space. Um, uh, and as Jess alluded to, I'm in Scotland. For those of you who are Ian Fleming fans, that building, where is it? Over there is Fetty's College, where James Bond went to school. Um, it's also where Tony Blair went to school. So <laughs> uh, slightly different characters there. So look, uh, again, thanks for, thanks for having us. Um, it's a real privilege. So I want to say a few things to begin with. Danny and I are research scientists. We are not clinicians. Uh, and so uh, if you have any specific questions regarding the health or that of your family, those are much better directed towards your nephrologist or GP or genetic counsellor or something like that. Um, the second thing is to say that we're really here to talk about our efforts to understand why cells in the kidney develop into cysts. And then as a sort of follow up to that, whether we can use that knowledge to develop treatments for PKD and and it's probably worth pointing out that as scientists, we, we were really about answering the first one of those questions and the uh, the commercialization side of it sort of came later on. So what I'm going to try and do today in the simplest possible way is to explain the questions we were trying to address, the results that we got in trying to address those questions, and then how that morphed somewhat weirdly into this startup company that Jess uh, mentioned earlier, and then to just discuss some of the the challenges in doing that, uh, and you know what we hope to do uh, going forwards. So I'd really encourage people. I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Um, scientists are by and large terrible at explaining what they do to the general public. Uh, they have a natural inclination to just get into the gobbledygook. Uh, so if there are things that I say that go way over people's heads. That's not your fault. That's mine. Um, uh, and I'm happy to sort of take some time and, and, and talk people through stuff if I've done uh, a terrible job of explaining what it is that we do. Denny, Denny's left the room. There you go. Uh, <laughs> as offended as he is. Okay, so everyone here knows what polycystic kidney disease is. Um, and it's what we would call in the scientific community a phenotype. So a phenotype is a technical term, which is essentially the physical manifestation of your genetic makeup. So your hair color is a phenotype, uh, your eye color is a phenotype, your height is to a certain extent a phenotype. So uh, PKD is the same. And the reason why I say that is because 
um, it reflects the fact that cysts can arise in the kidney for a whole different number of mechanisms. And, and I'm not going to talk in enormous detail about that. But essentially, you know, your kidneys are a bunch of tubules. Uh, those tubules are designed to filter blood and to remove uh, waste, and that's that's urine. What happens in PKD is that for reasons that we only partly understand, there's a physical dysregulation of the biology of those cells. And instead of sitting there doing their normal job as a little tubule, they start to grow, and then you get the formation of these cysts in the kidney. So... It's a genetically diverse disease, as again, you probably all know. And when most people talk about PKD, they talk about autosomal dominant PKD, which is by far and away the most common form of the disease. It's in, in medical terms, it sort of balances between being a rare disease and a common disease. The typical definition of a rare disease is one that affects one in two and a half thousand people. But, you know, one in a thousand people, I think is actually quite a lot. And as you again probably know, it's caused principally by, by mutations in one of two genes, PKD1 or PKD2. And rather confusingly, those genes, which are the genetic elements in your DNA, encode proteins called polycystin 1 and polycystin 2. Now, mostly scientists call the gene and the protein the same, but for whatever reason, I don't know, uh, we don't do that with PKD. Second type is autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. It's probably the second most common. It principally affects kids, um, uh, much rarer, uh, caused by mutations in a different gene. And then finally, although autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive PKD are part of this disease family, there's also this collection of things that we call ciliopathies. Um, and I'll talk about why they're called that in a second. These conditions tend to be syndromic, which is to say it's not just PKD. There's a whole bunch of other things going on in the patient. Uh, very diverse presentation, super rare. One in 100,000 people, one in 200,000 people, uh, and caused by changes in a whole bunch of different genes. So I'm going to talk about our work in two different uh, types of PKD. I'm going to talk about autosomal dominant PKD, and I'm going to talk about um, a particular ciliopathy uh, and that ciliopathy is called Joubert syndrome. So Joubert syndrome is one of these super rare conditions. Um, and patients who have Joubert syndrome have really complex disease. So it affects a whole bunch of different organs, their eyes, their brains, their lungs. The diagnostic feature, can you see my pointer on the screen, Jess? Yeah, I guess the yeah. diagnostic mm -hmm. feature in Joubert syndrome is what they call this molar tooth sign in the brain. So this is a scan through the Joubert syndrome patient's brain and you get this sort of tooth looking structure here anyway occasionally Joubert syndrome patients get um get kidney cysts uh and so we started working on this project particularly so scientists went and sequenced the genome of patients who have this disease and they found inherited gene variants in a gene called INPP5V the name is not particularly uh important um it's, it stands for very long uh we won't even go there it's just going to confuse things. So they showed pretty quickly that INPV5V mutations were associated with Joubert syndrome. So INPV5V is an interesting uh, protein. It controls how cell membranes behave. So your body is made up of 30 trillion cells. They're essentially little balloons, if you like, uh, with nuclear material in them, so your DNA and everything else. And, and the surface of those pollutants, the wrapping of the cells is, is, uh, is other cell membranes. And so INPP5V controls how those cell membranes behave. And that it particularly controls how a cell receives information from the outside world and how it responds to that information. Uh, and that's kind of important. So we were interested in trying to understand what this gene does. Um, and there's a number of different ways you can understand how genes function. Um, uh, we obviously knew that it was causing a disease, but we wanted to understand why it was that it was causing that disease. So uh, some people, some scientists study cells in a dish. We study cells in a dish, and you've probably seen these sorts of pictures uh, if you go to any sort of labby, researchy type web page. These are tissue culture dishes. So the little plastic containers, they're filled with a nutritive media and you can't see it, but on the bottom of these dishes, people grow cells, uh, which are derived from all sorts of places. So some of them are from you know, lungs, or kidneys or whatever else. Uh, and that can be a useful way of trying to understand what's going on in an individual cell. But we 
are of the view, don't you I, um, not the only ones, uh, that people are really complicated things. And so this is a really reductionist way of looking at how something works because it's a single type of cells growing in a dish. But people have trillions of cells. There's lots of different types of cells. There's lots of different organs. And obviously the way these cells are put together into tissues and the way those tissues are put together into organs is really quite complicated. So on the right hand side here, you can see um, uh, you can see a sort of a breakdown of the kidney with all of the filtrative components of the nephrons here. And these are all the different cell types that make up um, just the nephron uh, and the rest of the organ. So we take the view that trying to model this and trying to understand what a gene does in the context of the kidney is best done in a living kidney. Uh, and the best way to do that, at least in our view, but for kidneys in particular, is to use mice. So mice have been a model organism uh, for understanding the function of genes for years and years and years, hundreds of years, in fact. Um, uh, and in fact, in Victorian times, people kept mice as a, as a, it, was, it was called the mouse fancy, a bit like the way people keep uh, um, dogs and things these days. Uh, and anyway, we started to understand their genetics way back then. But we've got to the point now where we can start to modify the DNA of mice uh, to try and understand what particular genes do. So this is, you, know, you see these things in the popular press. Someone gets a mouse to express the fluorescent protein and they chuck them under a UV light and they glow, et cetera, et cetera. This is not what we do. Uh, <laughs> but it does illustrate the point that you can change the genome of a mouse uh, and use that uh, ability to study individual gene function. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how we've done that and what we've learned as a consequence. So let's just go back to Joubert syndrome and this gene INPV5E. What we did was we used genetic engineering to specifically remove the INPV5E gene from mice, and we wanted to ask what happens. So remember, we were doing this to try and understand why it is that patients who have variations in this gene uh, develop disease. So these are all sorts of, these are, so the first thing to say was that the mice didn't survive, which is sort of consistent with Joubert syndrome, which is a pretty severe disease. Uh, they have all sorts of strains. So these are the lungs, they don't develop properly. They have extra digits in their limbs. I'm not gonna go into any of that. All of this stuff though, tells us some of the things that INPP5E does. But the thing that we found particularly interesting was that the kidneys develop cysts. So here's a wild type kidney from an embryonic mouse. And you can see these little circular things are what are called the glomeruli. They're the bits that filter your blood. And all of these other parts in here are the tubules that then eventually take urine away from the organ. But in the INPP5E kidneys, uh, you can see that there's, there's these cysts forming uh, throughout the organ, which was uh, sort of pretty exciting for us. So, for reasons that I don't have time to go into and which are basically completely coincidental, we happen to be working on another gene at the same time, which is called Aurora kinase A. So in the talk, I'll abbreviate this to uh, this and I'll just call it Aurora, probably. So this is a gene which does something completely different. Instead of regulating membranes, it also helps the cells to divide. But what we found was that Aurora and INPP5E live in the same parts of the cell. So as scientists, we stain things with little fluorescent markers in cells, and that allows us to tell where a particular protein corresponding to a gene is in a cell. So this tiny little structure here I'll talk about in a second is called the primary cilia. But what you can see is that Aurora kinase here, which is green, and INPP5E, which is red, live in the same place at the bottom of the structure, which is why this is yellow. And again, you can see this, this is in the nucleus of the cell. And what you can see here is if you do a scan, INPP5E in green, Aurora kinase in red, and these two proteins are in the same place. And normally when two proteins are in the same place, it's indicative of the fact that they're either interacting with each other or they're involved in the same function of that particular part of the cell. And in this case, the reason why we were interested is because that one of those locations is this structure here, which is called the primary cilia. So primary cilia, you may have heard of, uh, they are a structure which is almost uniquely associated with the development of cystic kidney disease. Uh, and they are essentially little cellular antenna which sit uh, on the surface of the cell. 
So what you can see here is a picture, what's called a scanning electron micrograph of uh, the surface of a cell in the kidney. And this pink structure here, they're not normally pink, someone's uh, colored this in the image, is a primary cilia. And so almost every non-dividing cell in the body has a primary cilia. And these things are tiny. So this thing is about three millionths of a meter long. Uh, it's a tiny little structure. And for years and years and years and years, and people have known about these things for almost 100 years and they ignored them. They thought they were some sort of vestigial part of the body or part of the cell that was used when we used to swim around as, as tiny little microorganisms. But it turns out that they are all completely wrong and these things are super important. And they are very much like an antenna. So a lot of the machinery that a cell uses to detect what's going on in the outside world it localizes specifically into this tiny structure, right? So um, they're incredibly important organelles and for reasons that we're beginning to understand, they're incredibly important for regulating the biology of cells in the kidney and for stopping them to form cysts. So uh, we already knew that aurora kinase was associated with the growth of cysts in PKD because it's we can do stains for it and it's upregulated. And so we wanted to ask whether or not removing the aurora kinase gene prevented cysts from forming in mice that don't have iron PP thymine. So let me put that a different way. In a normal situation, the actions of iron PP 5 e this is our theory, bear in mind. In the normal kidney, the interactions of aurora kinase and iron PP 5 e balance themselves. And the tubules in the organ are this nice, tight little package of cells here. Our theory is that what happens when you delete iron PP5E, which is what I showed you in that in the picture of the mouse before, and which is what also happens uh, in the Joubert syndrome patients, we thought that there would be activation of aurora kinase, which drives an imbalance in the biology of the cells in the kidney, and as a consequence, you get the cysts formed. So the question we wanted to answer was: if you remove iron PP5E and you remove aurora kinase. Does that even the balance? Does that prevent cysts from forming in these in these mice? So to do that, I have to explain a little bit about how we do genetic engineering in mice. And I'm going to keep this fairly simple. So you remember before when we removed the iron pipe, iron PP5E gene completely, it resulted in the death of the mice. Now that's not helpful for us because we want to understand PKD. And as you all know, PKD is an adult onset disease, which is progressive, right? So to address this question, we use something called conditional gene deletion. So imagine this is a piece of DNA in the cell of each one of the, in the nucleus of each one of the cells of this mouse. And this is either the IMPP or the 5E or the, the Aurora gene. What we do is we engineer in little sequences above uh, on either side of an important part of the gene. Uh, and what these sequences allow us to do is to direct a particular tool to that part of the genome. And that tool is essentially a pair of molecular scissors. So if we express or produce these molecular scissors in the mouse, they'll run along, they'll find those sequences, and they'll chop everything out in between them. And if that happens to be the IMPP5E gene or the Aurora kinase gene, then it's gone. Now we can control when these scissors are produced and where these scissors are produced. So what we tend to do is we tend to use mouse strains where those scissors are only expressed in the tubules of the kidney and not anywhere else in the body. So that allows us, instead of looking at the function of IMPP5E in the whole organism, we can look at the function of IMPP5E just in the kidney and just in the cells which uh, normally form cysts uh, in patients with PKD. So I hope that makes, like, oh, eight questions there. You should have flagged it to me. Uh, is there anything substantive? Oh. Ooh. Heather, are you still having issues? No, no, I think it's just Heather. Okay, righto. Sorry, Heather. Um, right, so then we, so we can control where these scissors are expressed and then we can knock out our gene in that particular tissue at a particular time. Can't advance my slides at all now. All right. Okay, here's the experiment. Ignore all the fliffy flaffy words and everything else. All we're doing here is we're knocking out 
either one or both of these genes in the particular cells in the kidney which we're interested in studying in the context of cyst formation. Okay, so here is where we express the scissors. And I'll just explain this. This is a mouse kidney. There's a scale bar there. It's actually sitting on the top of a polystyrene box, which you can see in the background. And this is a histological section through the kidney. So we take a slice uh, right through the middle, and this allows us to, to look at the development of cysts. So this looks a bit smudgy and horrible, but this is actually a normal kidney, right? Um, if we knock out INPP5E, you can see that things get considerably worse. And this is exactly what we expect. It's what we expected from the whole organism knockout of this gene. Here, we're just knocking out the kidney. But you can see the kidney goes from this little bean shaped here into this great big uh, balloony shaped thing here. So it's the, it's the same scale. And if you look at the section, you can see that there's cysts all the way through this organ. Now, if we just knock out Aurora kinase A, and this was kind of a surprise, but a good surprise, nothing happens. So the kidney looks normal. It's about the same size as the normal kidney. If you look at the section, there's all this tissue in there. There's not all these terrible cysts and everything else. But if you knock out both of them, you go from this organ here and this section to this organ here and this section. So it's a considerable improvement. Um, there's a few cysts left behind, um, but they're nowhere near as severe as the as the um, as the uh, INPP five E lockout alone. So there's a bunch of graphs here, and I'll just take you through them. This is days along the bottom. So this is us aging the mice out, and this is the kidney to body weight ratio. So this is a way we use to assess uh, kidney size. Um, you know, you might go and have an MRI to do the same sort of thing. Here we just pop the kidneys out and weigh them. So the INPP5E mice are so sick they die at about three weeks of age. But what you can see here is the animals which have lost INPP5E and which have also lost to raw kinase, they're fine. Their kidney to body weight ratio goes up a bit, but then off they go. And mice, we've aged these guys out to about a year. Mice only live for a couple of years. Uh, so to all intents and purposes, these mice are effectively cured. And you can see that here reflected in cyst number as well goes up here there's actually even a slight decrease in the cyst number uh, as we age the mice out uh, and um, this is how we measure kidney function it's blood urea nitrogen we can't we can do GFRs but we don't do that uh, in mice and you can see here that the mice are sick uh, the INPP 5 e knockouts and then you can't tell the difference between a double knockout mouse and a normal mouse from then onwards so just to summarize that if we remove aurora kinase in the kidney in cells which are also lacking INPP5E, we can prevent the formation of cystic kidney disease, which is super exciting. Uh, we didn't really expect that. Um, and a lot of people said things about aurora kinase, which meant that we probably didn't even expect it. We thought that died, but they didn't, which is good. Okay, so this is the story. Balance between INPP5E and aurora kinase. Lose INPP5E get more activation of aurora kinase, get cysts, lose aurora kinase, lose INPP5E, you restore balance to the kidney and the kidney tubules are fine. So that was super exciting. Um, yeah. uh, but as I mentioned previously, Joubert syndrome is super rare. Uh, and patients, there's probably only half a dozen people in the world who have cysts in their kidney and have Joubert syndrome caused by mutations in INPP5E. But it was a useful indication for us that this protein aurora kinase might be really important for driving the formation of cysts in the kidney. So you're all familiar with autosomal dominant PKD. I talked about it earlier. Um, and I also mentioned that aurora kinase was, was uh, there was a lot of aurora kinase protein in, uh, in cysts from AD PKD patients. So we wondered whether or not aurora kinase deletion might protect you from the development of ADPKD in the same way that deletion of aurora kinase protects you against development of Joubert syndrome if you happen to be a mouse. Uh, and we initially concluded that we probably wouldn't because it's a completely different disease. It has completely different causative mutations in completely different genes. And because of this experiment, uh, which a group in the States had done a couple of years earlier. So this, this somewhat gory slide, this thing here, is a mouse liver. These two things here are the mouse kidneys. And so this animal here had 
mutations in the PKD1 gene. So it's essentially a model of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And when they gave those mice a drug called elicitib, which is an, inhibit an inhibitor which impacts on some of aurora kinase functions, it actually makes disease worse. So we, uh, we were initially skeptical that, uh, that removing aurora kinase would uh, prevent disease in, these, in, our, in our PKD mice. However, we did, a, we did the same experiment in our INPP5E mice. And remember that we can cure cystic disease in INPP5E mice. And we see the same sort of thing. We treat them with this drug, which is called elicitib, that actually makes disease worse. So maybe there are commonalities between the ADPKD mice and the INPP5E mice. And maybe our suggestion that we couldn't use aurora kinase to, to, to treat uh, ADPKD uh, is wrong. So we went ahead and did the experiment. So I'm going to talk about three different mouse models of ADPKD. So this is the this is the clinical presentation which you're all aware of. Probably uh, patients are born with variants in either PKD1 or PKD2. Typically, you get disease onset in the 20 to 30s, and then as as you progress through life, you get increasing levels of end stage renal disease. Um, it's kind of hard to model this in mice uh, because mice don't live for very long. Um, uh, but there are a number of different approaches, which I'll just step through very briefly. The first is that you can use the conditional approach I talked about before. So we can knock out the PKD genes early on in development, uh, and it results in really severe disease, which means the mice die early. So in the case of INPP5E, um, uh, the mice died at three weeks of age. But useful to understand the biology and useful to give us indications about what might be a, a, an interesting therapeutic approach. The second approach is to use conditional activatable PKD, and I'm going to talk about that later on. And then the third way is to use mice which naturally develop cysts, so we can use these as a way of looking at cyst progression. So I'm going to talk about all three of these mice in the context of ADPKD and aurora kinase. So just a reminder, what we're doing here is we think that loss of PKD uh, we know that loss of PKD results in cyst formation. So the little tubule on the left here gets really big and turns into a cyst. And we think that's because you get activation of aurora kinase. And it's the same question we wanted to ask last time. If you knock out PKD1 and you knock out aurora kinase, what happens? Okay, so you've seen these slides before, something similar. Ignore the gobbledygook over here. Here, this is our mouse where we're not doing anything. This is our mouse where we knock out PKD1. And you can see that this disease is really, really quick. So this develops, these mice develop, um, they essentially die uh, at postnatal day 12. So a couple of weeks after birth, really severe um, uh, PKD. Um, and these kidneys are lacking the PKD genes, PKD1, which is the most common cause of ADPKD. If we knock out a raw kinase, nothing happens. That's what we saw last time. If we knock out a raw kinase and PKD1, you see this fantastic rescue uh, in phenotypes. So kidney goes from this great big thing here to this little thing here. It goes from this incredibly cystic organ here to this relatively normal organ here. And you've seen these graphs before as well. Same sort of rescue. So prevention in the growth of the kidneys, uh, almost complete ablation of cysts within the organ, preservation of renal function as these mice age. So this was a super encouraging result. But I've, and as you all know, ADPKD is principally an adult disease. So we wanted a way to study exactly the same question about knocking out PKD1, about knocking out aurora kinase in an adult mouse. So I've already explained that we had the tools to remove a particular gene in the kidney at a particular time, at a particular place, depending on where we express these molecular scissors. The way you can do this is you use a genetic trick, which means that these scissors are still expressed in the particular cells in the kidney, but they only start doing their chopping, chopping thing when you give the mice doxycycline in their drinking water. So I'm not going to go into the mechanistics of how that works, but what it means is that you can have a completely normal mouse, and then you can administer doxycycline in the drinking water, and then... Uh, these scissors get activated and then they knock out the genes that you're looking at. So this allows us to, to study how disease progresses uh, in adult mice um, in which we've knocked out PKD1 or we've knocked out aurora kinase 
I would have knocked out both of them. And so this is the result of that experiment. So in this case, we've let the animals get to about a month of age, which for a mouse is essentially sexual maturity. And then we've knocked out either PKD1, and this is a section through uh, a kidney at about four months of age. Um, and you can see the cystic kidney disease here. This should normally be full of uh, nice uh, nephrons and, and, uh, and tissue around it. If we knock out one copy of aurora kinase, you have two copies of every gene in your body, except on the X chromosome, uh, Y chromosome, if you're male. Um, uh, and you can see the kidney gets smaller, and you can see that it gets much pinker, and you can see that there's a whole lot less of the cysts in here. And if you knock out both copies of aurora kinase, the kidney gets even smaller, and uh, you get a prevention of the cyst formation as well. And there's a bunch of graphs here, which are essentially the same thing. So we're looking at cyst size, we're looking at cyst number, we're actually looking at survival of these mice here. So let's just have a look at cyst size here. Uh, normal mouse, uh, sorry, normal mouse, mouse with PKD mutations, mouse with PKD mutations and loss of one copy of aurora kinase, mouse with PKD mutations and loss of two copies of aurora kinase. So you can see this progressive improvement uh, in the severity of disease here. And what this suggests is that aurora kinase deletion, even in adult onset models of PKD, uh, reduces cystic disease and it improves survival. And the other really important part of this finding was that we didn't need to get rid of all of the aurora kinase to have an effect. So that's important from a therapeutic perspective, and I'll come back to that later on. But just bear that in the back of your mind. So up until this point in time, uh, we've been co-deleting our genes at the same time. But what does that say about the role of aurora kinase in disease progression? And so for patients who already have cystic kidney disease, if you started messing around aurora, with aurora kinase, could that be beneficial? So to do that, we use another strain of mice which develops mild cysts anyway. It has a, it has a variant in the PKD1 gene, which doesn't kill the mice, but means they get progressive disease. And so in this experiment, we let the mice develop cysts, and then we deleted aurora kinase, and then we asked what happens to those cysts uh, after that. And this is essentially the answer. So here's a mouse with a normal aurora kinase. Here's a mouse where we've deleted both copies of aurora kinase. And what it effectively does is it's, and remember that the aurora kinase had been deleted a few months earlier, is that the cysts are still here, but they don't grow. Um, and that's really important, obviously, from uh, the perspective of preserving renal function uh, over time. So this shows that aurora kinase deletion can prevent the growth of existing cysts. Okay, so we've shown that PKD1 and aurora kinase have this relationship. If you knock out both of them, you get reduced cysts. Same with ion 5 e um, So this is super exciting, but how do we turn this into an actual treatment for the disease and we've spent obviously a lot of time trying to figure out the answer to that question so we've shown that depleting aurora kinase in the kidney will prevent cyst development and will halt the growth of existing cysts now we've done that genetically um, but it's physically it's ethically practically every other way pretty much impossible to do the same experiment on a person so we can't genetically engineer your kidneys uh, after the fact. But can we come up <coughs> with a way of removing the aurora kinase protein through some other mechanism? So these are the challenges we're facing. What sort of drug would do that? How do we make sure it actually gets made? Uh, and then finally, how do we pay for doing that? Uh, and I'll talk about all these things in a, in a little bit. So the first question is what such a drug would look like. There's a whole new family of drugs called targeted protein degraders. So they're starting to enter clinical trials. Now I think they're in about 25 different clinical trials. And these are what they say on the box. They targeted, they degrade proteins in a targeted fashion. They're also called Protax. Protax is the commercial name for them. So for example, um, a lot of these drugs are being developed as therapies for um, breast cancer so that they specifically degrade the estrogen receptor, for example. So they're chemically relatively simple drugs. They're made up of three separate parts. The first is called the warhead, 
and the warhead is the bit of the drug which binds to the protein you want to degrade. The second thing has a complicated name, which is an E3 ligase recruiter. And I'll tell you what this does in a second. And then the linker is just a little sequence which joins the two things together. So this is how Protac works. So here's your, here's your drug, there's your warhead, this is the link, linker sequence and the E3 ligase recruiter here. And here's aurora kinase. So we want to get rid of aurora kinase. So to do that, we design a drug which has a warhead on it, uh, which specifically recognizes and binds to aurora kinase. Now, I talked about this E3 ligase recruitment element at the back here. What this does is it recruits another protein in the cell uh, whose job is specifically to target any neighboring protein uh, with um, a little chemical addition called ubiquitin. So the cell has a very um, advanced way of identifying which proteins in it it needs to get rid of. And one of those ways of doing that is to find these ubiquitin targeted proteins. And so what the cell then does is it directs um, this modified protein to essentially its garbage bin. So this is a structure called the proteasome and the proteasome takes in uh, proteins which have been targeted with this particular uh, chemical element and chops them up. Uh, so that's essentially how cells, one of the major ways that cells control uh, the levels of protein within a cell. And so essentially all these drugs are doing is they're co-opting this machinery to specifically degrade whatever protein that you want to degrade. So in our case, it's aurora kinase. Um, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about what we've done in that space um, uh, in a second. The second question is how do you make sure it gets made? Um, so the first thing is to protect the idea. So we filed to date one patent covering this work, and this is what we call a method of use patent. And that essentially says that if you want to use degradation of aurora kinase as an approach to treating PKD, you have to come and speak to us first. It's really important to get IP protection, partly because if you just put things out there, some drug company might take it away and, uh, and, and do whatever with it. It's also important to, um, to effectively control how, um, how work in the area is is done. And so we're not being mercenary when we do this. Uh, it's really useful. To, so for example, let's say we want to get investment to try and develop these drugs. If you don't have intellectual property, then venture capital companies, pharmaceutical companies, they're not interested. Uh, so that's important. The second thing is to come up with a vehicle for doing some of this research and to attract funding from government, from venture capital and from pharma. And so we started a little company uh, last year called Existence Bio. And I'll give you a timeline about how this has worked uh, in the past. Okay, and then the final thing is how do we pay for it? So this is this is the reality of developing drugs. And it's 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 probably a bit longer than it should be because we're in academia. Um, but this is essentially what happened. So we did the first work looking at PKD1 and Aurora kinase in mice back in about 2017. I was trawling through my emails last night. I probably got that slightly wrong. It could have been even earlier than that. And we thought these results were super exciting. So at this point, we weren't thinking we weren't thinking therapies. We were just thinking we've found this protein. It's really important for the development of cysts and kidneys. And so we wrote a grant for the NHMRC, uh, which wasn't awarded. The next year, we wrote another grant for the NHMRC, which wasn't awarded. Uh, and look, at the same time, we were using soft money that we had in the lab to keep going with the work. And then finally, in 2019, we got awarded funding uh, from the government to look at this specific project. So it's important to understand that grant schemes in Australia uh, are super competitive. Uh, typically, only one in 10 grants gets funded in this country. It's a, I'm not going to start a rant, but it's a lot less than most other developed countries around the world. Just leave it at that. Um, not that we aren't hugely grateful to the NHMRC for supporting us, but it's a competitive environment. So we patented the method of use patent back in 2021, and you file what's called a provisional patent, which is essentially then kept secret uh, from the rest of the world for about a year, year and a half, and then you move that into a full patent, which then becomes published, etc. So we've gone through that whole process. At this point, we started to think, well, maybe we could come up with some way or to develop these targeted protein degraders as therapies. So we got a $20,000 grant from um, an organization called Therapeutic Innovation Australia. 
So TIA is funded by the federal government. Uh, it's specifically set up to fund early stage drug development programs uh, in labs. And they've been fantastic. We got a second TIA grant in 2022 and a third one in 2023. And the deal with all of these grants is that they're matched. So Monash University, to their enduring credit, uh, matched uh, all of this funding as well. Um, and so using this therapy, and I think as far as I'm aware, we're the only project that's ever been funded three times by TIA. Um, so using this sort of seed funding, we started to build started to build drug compounds uh, using this TPD approach, which, which looked like they worked. We received a development grant from the federal government um, at the end of 2023 to do this. And then we received the Curate Award, which Jess mentioned earlier, which is again uh, an award from the federal government for half a million dollars. So that's essentially sort of a startup um, funding. And as part of that startup, we founded our company uh, at the same time. So that's essentially the journey that it's taken us to get this far. Um, it's, I spend, most, Denny does all the work uh, and the other guys in the lab. I spend most of my time writing grants to try and get this stuff funded. And what the point we're at at the moment is really one where, uh, I'll talk about it in a second. So we have a portfolio of about 50 different targeted protein degraders, which are specific to Aurora kinase. And they're amazingly potent compounds. So two millionths of a gram of one of these things in a litre of water degrades more than 50% of Aurora kinase in the cell. And that looks great on paper, but there's a whole bunch of things that we need to consider in terms of drug development. I'll talk about that in a second. So we're about to run out of money in the existing Curati grant. We've still got the development grant there. We're hoping for another half million dollars from the Curator program. We're discussing with venture capital groups. We have an ongoing planning for another million dollars in funding. All of this may or may not eventuate. Um, I don't know, uh, but obviously we, we're doing our best to make it happen. But the really critical things from this point are twofold or threefold, really. So once you've developed a targeted protein degrader, how do you deliver them? So is it an injection? Is it a tablet? Uh, is it a sort of subcutaneous injection type thing? All of those things are really complicated chemically. So you'll be aware that not all things that you swallow uh, are absorbed into your body. It's fair enough. Uh, and so we need to do a lot of chemistry to try and make sure that, um, or to try and ensure that the TPDs we've made are what are called orally bioavailable. So instead of having to inject yourself every day or every week, you can just take a tablet. The second question, and this is super important, is are these things going to be toxic? So um, it's possible they could degrade other proteins in the body. Obviously not good. It's possible they could be too good at degrading Aurora kinase in your body, and that might cause other problems. And so I reckon that's probably going to cost us about two and a half million dollars to work that out. Because they're not simple questions, and the experiments you need to do to answer them are not simple experiments. The second question is, do they work? Uh, and we don't know the answer to that. So they work in a cell. We can degrade Aurora kinase in a cell really, really, really well. But can they degrade Aurora kinase in an animal model? Can they specifically uh, degrade Aurora kinase in a model of PKD? And will they work? Uh, and we don't know the answer to those questions. Um, but you need to answer those questions before you move anywhere closer to, to a clinical trial. So the hard realities are that it costs a lot of money to bring a drug to market. So it's about a billion dollars, it's been estimated, maybe slightly cheaper than that now to take a drug from first principles all the way through to, you know, a commonly available pharmaceutical. But, you know, that sounds like a big number, but the cost of treating ADB PKD in the States alone is about $7 billion a year. So I think you can make a really reasonably strong um, commercial argument about this. Nine out of 10 biotech startup companies fail. We may not be here talking to you next year as, as representatives of Existence Bio. 90% uh, of drugs in development fail clinical trials. And the reasons for that are principally around safety of it, safety or efficacy. That is, it makes you sicker than you were before, uh, for whatever reason, usually because it's toxic to your kidney, ironically. 
Uh, and secondly, it's an issue with efficacy, so it doesn't work that well um, in, in preventing disease. But I don't want to sound too down about all these things. I mean, I think it's super exciting. The whole existence thing has been super exciting. Uh, and we're really sort of dedicated to the work. Drug design is improving. And these sorts of things like targeted protein integrators, there aren't any approved in clinical trials yet, but they hold a lot of promise in, in, in addressing disease. The second thing is that even if you do an experiment and it fails, and that goes for experiments, companies, studies, trials, it all tells us something about the disease, uh, one way or another. And most most breakthroughs in, in modern, medicine, modern medicine and treatment at least are built on the back of those sorts of previous studies. Um, you know, maybe they don't fail, maybe they fail for one reason, but they still tell you the approach, for example, is a valuable one. So, for example, we might cure cysts in a mouse but kill it for another reason. That still tells us a lot about cysts and it provides us with opportunity to try and address uh, the problems in a, in a particular approach um, in a different way. So these are people who've done the work mostly. It's Denny and a previous PhD student called Ming Shen. Um, but there's a bunch of people in the lab who've helped out, particularly uh, the TPD space and the chemists. Designing drugs is a completely different profession, language, everything else to the sort of stuff that we do. And, and we, it's only through working with chemists who are also at Monash uh, to try and develop these compounds that we've been able to make any progress. And then there's some really helpful people in the international community. A lot of you will know Steve Somlo, perhaps, or perhaps have heard of him. He cloned one of the original PKD genes. I was at a conference with him the day before yesterday. Uh, he's been incredibly um, generous in terms of sharing reagents like the mice and everything else. And then obviously all of the uh, the different founding bodies, which uh, funding bodies, which have helped. So. We've received PK, support from PKD Australia, not so much on the drug development side of things, but that's incredibly um, uh, helpful in trying to help us do what we do. The partnership with the PKD Foundation in the US, I think is really important. Uh, and that's been super, uh, super helpful in the past. And so I am more than happy to take any questions at all uh, from people. I was sitting there last night going through, um, going through silly cartoons to put at the end of things. And I was reminded by, the next cartoon, which has got nothing to do with the talk, but my father sent me this in an envelope. Nothing else, just cut this thing out of a newspaper and sent it to me. Uh, it still makes me laugh. Anyway, uh, happy to take any questions, and I'll stop sharing. So there is a question uh, in the Q and A section, Ian. Um, oh yeah. It says, "With with slide with the three kidneys, the smaller ones." Does it work effectively or is there a reduction in function? I'm not sure uh, exactly which slide it's referring to. Well, can I see that? Oh, let me check. Uh, I'm assuming, oh, sorry, low. The three kidneys, the small one, does it work effectively? Is it? No, as far as we can tell, so I'm assuming you're referring to, Alan, I presume you're referring to uh, those conditions where we removed um, uh, aurora kinase in either the context of INPP5E or PKD1. Uh, the kidney seems to work completely fine. Uh, so we had those we had those bun graphs, the blood urea nitrogen graphs, uh, and they're essentially normal. Uh, the other thing, I guess, in in the context of therapeutic kidney development, is that is that if you can arrest decline in renal function, then for most people, that will be okay. That will be enough, sort of thing. Um, uh, and I think that that's important. That's a fantastic question, Jeanette. Um, so I'm skipping back to... So, Alan, does that answer your question? Oh. Anyway, hopefully, yes. Um, okay. Uh, in the best case scenario, how long could this be an actual usable drug? Um, it's a hard question. And most people, most times you get asked this question, people will say five to ten years. Um but they're kind of guessing. A lot of it depends on money. So for us, at least, the aim is to get funding to do those two critical critical experiments. So to do assess toxicity uh, and to assess efficacy and delivery. Once we've done those three things, they're probably experiments which would take 18 to 24 months. The idea then would be that you would um, partner with a pharmaceutical company or a large um, venture capital group 
to start doing preclinical trials. So trials, in, probably you'd try in the second animal model, but preclinical trials where you start doing experimental uh, assessments in patients, and obviously these would have to be relatively long-term, so three years, uh, and then uh, go from there. So that's five years already, five to 10 years. Okay. Um, I'm not a clinical trialist. I don't know who asked the question about uh, other drugs that are having significant success. There's been a lot of activity in the PKD space. I know that much. And it's it's funny, actually, I think in the last three to five years, there's been a real recognition, particularly in the PKD space, is that this is a disease which is relatively common. It cause, causes a, a lot of burden to the healthcare system and to the patients who have it. And it's effectively unaddressed because Telvaptin, while it's an advance, is not curative. It's very expensive. Um, and so there's been a lot, I can say there's been a lot of investment from various pharmaceutical companies around developing new treatments. Now, we wouldn't necessarily know about a lot of those. There were some quite prominent recent failures, Bartoxalone and others. Um, but there's a lot of movement in the space. Um, so I'm just working through things on both screens here. Helen, organoids. Um, <laughs> I have some I have some interesting views on organoids. Uh, I know Melissa Little, I know a lot of the organoid space really well. And what they've done is really fantastic. And I think it's it's super exciting. But at the end of the day, the kidney organoids that we have now are essentially uh, the same as a fetal kidney entering its second trimester, if you like. So it's a primitive embryonic organ. As a model, it's a it's a model of a primitive embryonic organ, and ADPKD happens, you know, way after that. Um, it also happens in the context of a circulatory system and a urine production system, and all the things that don't exist in organoids. So uh, I still think that that mice can and should be the primary focus. Having said that, looking forwards at testing efficacy and those sorts of things. We want to get as early an indication as we can that the drugs we've developed are potentially useful in humans because you see a lot of a reasonably large number of cases where people trial a drug in a mouse and it's great and then you trial the drug in a person and it does nothing. So all of our drug development pipelines and the sort of efficacy testing that we're planning on doing going forwards do utilise... Um, uh, ADPKD organoid models. So some of them are models generated from essentially fetal stem cells. Others are culture models uh, where they've collected cells from patients with ADPKD and they can grow those cells in a sort of cyst-like state. <coughs> and so I think I favour the latter ones more than the former ones. So they have a role, uh, but it's not an instructive one. It's the sort of one where we can we can start to start to test um, human efficacy. And it's weird because a lot of these problems are ones that those things we address are not because we think that they're scientifically interesting, but because that's what pharma wants. So for farmers, pharma to come in and put $50 million investment in this, they want to have seen the organoid experiments. And I guess that's fair enough. And so we will definitely do that. But it's not the be all and end all. Okay, so the evidence that this will manage liver cysts also, that's a really good question. And I don't know the answer to that. And one of the reasons why I'm here uh, is because the group next door works specifically on polycystic liver disease. Uh, so the mouse models are not great uh, for developing um, uh, cystic liver disease. I'm here on sabbatical, sorry, for the next six months. So I should have explained that. Uh, and one of the reasons is because I've come to a lab which works specifically on cilia and I've come to a lab which works which is next door to one that works specifically on polycystic kidney disease uh, liver disease so we're going to look at that okay so josephine asks, can this reverse the progression if you're on the way to dialysis uh, i don't know the answer to that question i don't know whether these therapies will work in people what we understand from mice uh, is that it can prevent um, the progression or the growth of existing cysts and so uh, at a sort of a worst case scenario, I would hope that um, that would allow people to preserve a level of kidney function that they already have. The question of whether or not there's a regression is an open one. I think that Denny and I uh, 
uh, are open to that possibility and there's some suggestions of it in the data that we have uh, but you know I wouldn't want to speculate too much on that um, um, yeah and I saw some wonderful ex well, wonderful talk by by Steve Somlow at this conference I was just at where he and some of you might be familiar with the work where you re-express the the um, the wild type versions of the PKD genes in a diseased kidney and the reversion of disease is spectacular. Um, so what it says is that is that at least in mouse models, if you delete these polycystin proteins, they develop cysts, but it's it's only the absence of the polycystin proteins which keeps the cysts there. As soon as you reintroduce them and they do that genetically, the cysts just disappear. Uh, and he thinks that's because um, those cells in the cyst have a secretory phenotype, so they make fluid and they blow the cysts up. And as soon as you put the polycystin back, uh, that secretory phenotype disappears and the cyst disappears as well. I think that's hugely encouraging. It's a long way from that observation to a therapy, uh, but I think it does open the, poss the strong possibility that, um, uh, that, there's, that, that there's the possible for developing um, therapies which, which essentially reverse disease. And for a lot of conditions, that's not the case. Um, uh, and I think in this case, that's that's a really positive thing. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we also have time for. So we'll finish up there. Um, thank you so much to both of you for taking some extremely complicated science and years of very important work and also grant writing and presenting um, it to us in an extremely understandable way. Um, I found that I very interesting. Honest. Yes, no, I think that was, we had one comment here um, from Paolo that says A1 communication skills and completely <laughs> logical structure and delivery of information. So um, yes. Thank you. And uh, thank you to everybody else for also attending and taking interest in this important science. And also just um, on behalf of the board of PKD Australia, I'd like to sincerely thank you, Ian and Denny, for your time, taking time out of your evening, Denny, and taking time out of your morning and your sabbatical, Ian. And um, thank you for your expertise and experience. And I wish everybody a good evening and hope to see you at our next webinar. Cheers. Cheers.